Hello. I've always found that the very best way of starting any research project is to ask a question. Simply because asking a question provokes the need to supply an answer, even if the answer might be, I don't know. The project that I'd like to share with you was started by a fairly straightforward question. In my former life, I was closely involved in an archive of material relating to Konstantin Stanislavski and his work at the Moscow Art Theatre. Part of that archive was a photographic collection, over 200 images of productions at the Moscow Art Theatre, which represented Stanislavski either as an actor, a director, or as a producer. Now, I'd worked with those images, putting them together for exhibitions in London, editing the images for exhibition catalogues, and working with a commercial photo agency creating digital copies for an online repository. But even though I was really familiar with the photographs, strangely there was one question that I had never asked. Now I knew the names of the plays. I knew the names of many of the actors who appeared in the photographs and the characters that they were playing. I knew who had directed the productions. I knew when, and sometimes even where, the photographs had been taken. I knew the names of some of the photographers, and I even knew why the photographs had been taken. Although we take production photographs for granted today, in the late 19th century they were not so common. Most production photographs, heavily posed, were used as advertising to promote the productions in front of house displays, to be printed in newspapers and magazines, or sometimes to be sold as souvenirs to those people who had seen the production. But the Moscow photographs were entirely different. From the staging of their very first production in 1898, and this is it, you can see on the screen now, Alexei Tolstoy's play Tsar Fyodor Ivanovich, the company decided to make a photographic record of every single one of the plays that they produced. There was a very practical reason for this. The company operated the repertoire system, a number of different productions staged in each season and performed in rotation. And if a production was a success, it would be brought back again for the next season and so on. So having a really good photographic record of what the production looked like was hugely helpful when it came to reconstructing the sets and knowing exactly how the furniture, props and costumes were used. The photographs enabled the company to restage productions accurately year after year as required. A kind of uh, the theatrical recycling, uh, if you like, which is maybe something that we're not so familiar with in the West. But of course, these photographs, as well as having a practical purpose, have become far more important to us as visual records of what the original productions looked like. So here we come back to the one question that I had not asked. Who had designed the productions which appeared in so many of these photographs? Now, having identified the question, a little detective story begins. It was fairly easy to find out the name of the man who designed the first productions at the Moscow Art Theatre, and who was to go on to design some of the most important and influential productions that the company staged during Stanislavski's lifetime. His name was Viktor Andreevich Simov, born in Moscow in 1858 and died there in 1935. So I began to search for any information that I could find about Viktor Simov. I thought that surely someone who'd made such an important contribution to the early success of the Moscow Art Theatre, who'd been a major collaborator of Stanislavski's, and who had designed a series of such historically significant and iconic productions, surely it would not be difficult to find out more about him. But to my surprise, my searches resulted in very little information. There were quite a few brief references to Simov, sometimes a few sentences offering a short biographical detail. There were, for example, four sentences in Wikipedia and one short paragraph in the Cambridge Introduction to Scenography. But at least as far as English publications were concerned, there seemed to be very little else. So with the help of a colleague who speaks very fluent Russian, we began to look at Russian language material. 
Now surely there would be much more here. We found a short essay in the two-volume history Moscow Art Theatre 100 Years, which had been published in 1998, and that was very helpful. Then we found references to an unpublished Russian PhD thesis, which had been completely unable to locate anywhere. Then it seemed that things were looking up, because we found references to a published biography by Olga Nekrasova. Published in 1952 in Moscow, it was part of a series called the Popular Library of Art, and it was only 44 pages long. Here it is. We know exactly what it looks like, but we could not find a copy anywhere. Then finally, we found exactly what we've been looking for. And here it is. The book is called Decorator of the Art Theatre, Viktor Andreevich Simov by Yuri Ivanovich Nekoroshev. Originally published by Soviet Artist, the official publishing house of the Artists' Union of the USSR. Now notice the use of the term decorator. The term designer to describe Simov is hardly ever used in this book, even though it was only written 35 years ago. Simov is usually referred to as an artist, but hardly ever as a designer. And we'll come back to that a bit later because I think it's very significant. Yuri Nekoroshev, who wrote the book, had originally trained as a theatre designer himself, and he went on to become an editor, an arts journalist and a critic. The quality of his descriptions of Simov's designs and his evident understanding of the work was immediately obvious to us. This was the book we'd been looking for. It had never been republished since it first appeared, and there had never been an English translation. But then we hit another problem. We couldn't find any records of the ownership of copyright on the book. The publisher doesn't exist any longer, and the original author died nearly 20 years ago. But his son, who's a television director who lives in Moscow, kindly gave us permission to use his father's work. And here it is. The work is completed, and the book was published by Routledge in December of 2019. Now, everyone who publishes a book believes that their book is important. Well, of course they do, otherwise they wouldn't do it. So why do I think that this new book about Seamoff is important? Well, briefly, Seamoff seems to me to be an almost forgotten figure in the history of Russian theatre. And yet he made a huge contribution to the success of the Moscow Art Theatre during this very important part of Stanislavski's career. He established the role of designer within the company, a role that had never really existed before. He created the designs for some of the most important and influential theatre productions of the time, especially Chekhov's major plays. But perhaps most importantly of all, he developed a method of work and a status for the designer, which has contributed to how we think of scenography today. You know, it's sometimes easy to forget that the clearly defined role of scenic designer in the theatre is a relatively modern one. Certainly at the end of the 19th century, when Simov began to work in the theatre, no one was really identified as having designed the production. In most cases, the scenery for stage productions was created by a number of different people, scenic painters and scenic carpenters, sometimes working together in a single studio, but sometimes working in relative isolation. And quite often, each scene and each act of a play might have been created by a completely different artist. Sometimes a famous artist would be engaged to create the overall look of a production, here in the UK, for example, Sir Henry Irving employed artists such as Lawrence Alma Tadema and Ford Maddox Brown to create images for how his productions might look. But generally, these artists only supplied sketches, and it was left to the highly talented painters, men such as Joseph Harker, to turn those sketches into actual working sets. The modern idea of integrated design, the concept of a single designer with an overview of the entire production, which we take for granted today, 
was relatively rare at this time. And of course, it only really begins to emerge with the work of Adolphe Apia, who was born in 1862, and of Edward Gordon Craig, who was born 10 years later. Perhaps significantly, Simov predates both of them. The major changes in mid to late 19th century theatre design were the move towards scenery that was historically accurate, realistic, specific to the production, and moving away from the earlier tradition of flat painted scenery. And this is the world into which Simov emerges. He trained as a painter in Moscow, graduating in 1882, and his main interests were in the areas of graphic design historical painting and architecture. His closest friends, including the artists Isaac Levitan and Nikolai Chekhov, who was the brother of playwright Anton Chekhov. It was Levitan, who is seen here in a rather striking self-portrait, who first got Simov involved in the theatre. In 1885, Levitan and Nikolai Chekhov were both working as scenic painters for the private opera company run by the fabulously rich industrialist Sava Mamontov, which was based on his estate at Abramtsevo, north of Moscow. Mamontov employed some of the most interesting and important artists of the time to create visual images for his productions, and they included Konstantin Korovin, Valentin Serov and Ivan Bilibin. Levitan invited Simov to join the team of painters. And in his first year, he created two scenes for Gounod's opera Faust, one for Bizet's Carmen, and one for Glinka's A Life for the Tsar. But Simov later wrote that even though he designed the scenes, all of the painting was done collectively in the workshop, which he described as low, cramped, and not at all adapted to our needs, lit by kerosene lamps. He worked for the Mamontov Company for two seasons, and unfortunately, none of those early designs have survived. But just to give you a flavour of the kind of work that these artists were producing, this is a design by Isaac Levitan. This is a scene from Glinka's opera A Life for the Tsar from 1885, on which Simov also worked. You can see the original pencil sketch at the top of the picture, and then the full idea as a watercolour sketch. For the next 10 years, Simov continued to work as a freelance painter. He was moderately successful, and he'd already started to exhibit his paintings with a group of artists called the Wanderers. This group had been founded in the 1860s by a group of young art students at the Imperial Academy who rebelled against the very conservative establishment with their strict rules defining what was considered high art and what was not. These young painters were interested in realist art, realistic portrayals of everyday life, and they wanted to make their work more widely available to the people. Now, Simov had already encountered the very artificial world of the mainstream 19th century theatre, and he had already started to think about how it could be different. After one visit to the theatre, he described the set as a boring template, serving no other purpose than to fence off the acting area. Instinctively, he knew that he could do something different, something better. And it's not surprising that the Wanderers had a very profound influence on his work, certainly in relation to his work for the theatre. And we only have to look at a few examples of that work to understand why that was the case. These two paintings by Ilya Repin, who became a leading member of the group, are full of dramatic realism, real characters caught in a moment of action. They are highly theatrical, almost filmic in their detail and their immediacy. Vladimir Makovsky's painting Bankruptcy could almost be a scene from a play or even a still from a film. Characters caught in a moment of high drama, each with an individual intention and motivation in the scene. 
just like actors in a play. And I simply could not resist including this painting, also by Makovsky, called The Party, which to me seems almost like a missing scene from a forgotten play by Chekhov, complete with very theatrical lighting. Simov began to understand what he wanted to achieve with his painting, and the theatre seemed to be the ideal place in which to do this. His life was changed completely by a meeting he had in 1896 with a young Konstantin Stanislavski. In 1888, at the age of 25, Stanislavski had founded a group called the Society for Art and Literature. The group included both amateur and professional actors, and they aimed at creating productions that were historically accurate. Stanislavski acted and directed in a whole series of productions which included several Shakespeare plays, The Merchant of Venice, Julius Caesar, Twelfth Night and Othello. The now famous image of Stanislavski as Othello in 1896. In the autumn of that year, the artist Pavel Osipov told Simov that a young theatre director was interested in meeting him. Stanislavski was looking for an artist to design a production of a play called The Sunken Bell by Gerhard Hauptmann. After that first meeting, Simov wrote, I had found the closest, most important, and most inspirational interpreter of the true meaning of art. I found originality, the truth in creative endeavor, and profundity in the search for an escape from conventional routine. I was seized by a mixture of joy and anxiety. Here are two of Simov's original drawings for that production. From that first meeting developed a professional relationship that was to result in Simov designing 49 productions for Stanislavski's company between 1898 and 1932. When Stanislavski and Nemirovich Danchenko founded the Moscow Public Theatre, which shortly after became known as the Moscow Art Theatre, Simov was offered the permanent job of decorative artist and stage designer. Yes, interestingly, on that occasion Stanislavski used the D word. Simov designed the first production for the new company. Alexei Tolstoy's Slav Fyodor Ivanovich opened in October 1898. From the very beginning we can see how Simov developed the role of designer and created a working practice that would be very familiar to professional theatre designers today. Now, whereas in the past he would have just been told what was needed for the production and he would then be expected to just go away and create the scenery, now he was involved in the process right from the very beginning. He had an initial meeting with a director, usually Stanislavski, of which the concept for the production and the main ideas were discussed sometimes for several days. He then prepared a first set model, which he always called a maquette, and took this to another meeting for more detailed discussions. That resulted in a second, more detailed model. He would attend the first read-through of the play with the acting company and arranged research trips, often accompanied by Stanislavski and the actors, to see authentic settings, buildings, furniture and costumes which could then be incorporated into the design. This authenticity, which you can clearly see in the photograph from the production, became a central feature of Simov's work as a designer. This is the earliest of Simov's set models that still exists. It's in the archive of the Moscow Art Theatre. It shows us the level of detail that Simov included in his models. And there are two things that I find very interesting. Each part of the model is flat painted. There is no three-dimensional detail. That didn't happen until much later. And even though I've tried very hard, I cannot find out if Simov worked to any standard scale in his models. We would now expect a set model to be produced at a scale of 1 to 25 nor if he also produced scale drawings for the workshop. He doesn't mention this. 
he does talk about working with the painters in the scenic workshop and scaling up the designs for the model to the full size scenery. But frustratingly, he doesn't say what method he used in order to do this. Very detailed costume drawings, and there are two examples here. They're really beautiful and full of character. Stanislavski was a very demanding director to work with, partly because he had many detailed visual ideas of his own and clearly had very firm ideas of how he wanted the production to look. But it was obvious from the very beginning that this shared interest in detail and authenticity was what created such an important bond between Stanislavski and Simov and made it possible for them to collaborate on so many important productions. Stanislavski was famous for the length of his rehearsal period. Safiador, for example, had over 70 rehearsals. And during that process, there were many changes. Simov had to scrap entire scenes from his design and recreate them with completely new ideas. He also developed a practice of discussing the characters with the actors, as well as developing ideas for the costume designs. And this was very unusual at this time. So we begin to see here the start of a very organic and collaborative approach to creating the production, which resulted in an integrated process that seems very familiar to us today. Now, at this point, there was a decision that had to be taken. Uh, either I could give you a potted history of Simov's entire career, but I thought that maybe that might be just a little too dull. So what I'd like to do is to show you some of what I believe to be the most important, interesting and influential productions that he designed, and to use some of Simov's own words to support the images. At the end of Nekoroshev's book, he included as a kind of appendix, some extracts from a manuscript that was written by Simov himself. Now, I imagine that they were intended to be part of an autobiography that was never actually published. Those pages are incredibly revealing, and they perhaps give us a greater insight into Simov the man than Nekoroshev's biography ever could. Fortunately, we were able to include all of that material in our new edition. Simov designed the full cycle of Anton Chekhov's major plays over a six-year period. He started with the seagull and he ended with Ivanov. Stanislavski co-directed the production of the seagull and he played the role of Trigorin. You can see him here in this character study from the original production with Maria Roxanova as Nina. The Seagull had originally opened at the Alexandrinsky Theatre in St. Petersburg in October 1896, and it had been a disaster. But Nyamirovich Danchenko believed in the play, and he persuaded Stanislavski to revive it as part of the Moscow Art Theatre's first season. Simov was not very happy with his work on this production. He felt that his design did not reflect the tone of the play. He wrote, the scenery for the first act never satisfied me. I still had not grasped the extraordinary subtlety and lightness with which he, Chekhov, wished to convey the emotional moods of the characters through costume, landscape and so on. For example, Stanislavski wanted to create the effect of the moon passing across the sky. And even though they brought in a lighting specialist to improve on the effect, Simov was not happy with it. He wrote, the park remained a park and there was a moon, but it was not Chekhov. Looking at the designs now, they certainly do seem to lack some of the subtlety and nuance of his later work. But it may well be that this was still the work of a relatively inexperienced designer. Simov approached the design of Uncle Vanya in the following year in a completely different way. Stanislavski again co-directed and he played the role of Astrov with his wife Maria Lilina as Sonia. He wanted to create in his own description the dying remnants of the decaying old order. 
The interior sets, the furniture and props are entirely realistic. This is a world of boredom, of everyday existence, of provincial life, entirely lacking in glamour of any kind. It is the everyday world that Chekhov captured so effectively. In Henry David Thoreau's words, lives of quiet desperation. Simov adopted a different style of painting for the exterior sets on this production. He left aside the broad brush strokes of the earlier designs and, in his words, changed to a form of pointillism, using small strokes and dots of colour to paint the leaves, clouds, pine needles and so on. We also decided to leave small gaps of unpainted canvas to give a feeling of airiness and quivering light. Everything seemed to vibrate and to move. Writing about the first production of Chekhov's Three Sisters in 1901, Simov described a passionate quest for realism. He wrote, we strove to ensure that the set was exactly right, down to the smallest detail. Critics laughed at us because our chest of drawers had no less than two dozen knickknacks on it. But if you take that away, then the whole stage atmosphere is lost. This commitment to detail and accuracy is something that we come across time and time again in Simov's notes. Of the three sisters, he wrote, I tried to ensure that the interiors came out of the workshop with a strong sense of being lived in, so that from them, the spectators could judge the character and the habits of the owner. The desired effect was sometimes more successful, sometimes less, but such was my constant objective. It's fascinating here to be able to compare a pencil sketch of the original design of Three Sisters with a slightly later watercolour sketch showing how the design developed. Simov's theatrical skills were developing rapidly, and so was his relationship with Stanislavski. In the earlier notes, you get the impression that although Stanislavski appreciated Simov's talents, he didn't always completely trust his judgment. Stanislavski was a man of firm opinions. Writing about the preparation for Three Sisters, Simov says that he proposed using brighter colours in his set design, but Stanislavski consistently refused. In the end, I always complied with his requirements, Simov wrote. After all, if the accompaniment drowns out the melody, the integrity of the music disappears. Simov realised very clearly that his role was always going to be to serve the needs of the production, rather than to follow his own independent concept. In one of the most revealing passages in his memoirs, he acknowledges Stanislavski's influence on his own development. The stage designer is not a soloist, merely an accompanist. My own directorial flair constantly developed under the influence of Stanislavski. I observed how his creative imagination brought to life seemingly insignificant details and how boldly and originally stage settings were selected. I observed and learnt. I cannot but admit that I owe a great deal to Konstantin Sergeyevich in this respect. Chekhov's final play, The Cherry Orchard, opened at the Moscow Art Theatre in January 1904. In this production, Simov concentrated on trying to capture the very particular world of the characters, so that his design could help the audience to appreciate what their lives were really like. To achieve this, he decided not to stage one specific house, but to try and combine the features and characteristics of all of the country houses that he had seen. Once again, the challenge here was to represent a world that was disappearing. Simov took the advice that was given to him by Tolstoy. One should not be carried away by one reality, but should generalize the type its nature and situation. He described his approach. Looking through various albums and notebooks, I chose sketches which seemed most indicative of that dying class. Past wealth has melted away, and the remnants of luxury are sad reminders of an affluent bygone era. 
Ranevskaya's house in its dilapidated state is but a shadow of its former glory. In his designs for the cherry orchard, Simov claimed to be heavily influenced by the work of his old friend Isaac Levitan. He considered Levitan to be the artist whose work came closest to the spirit of Chekhov. He wrote, Although, of course, I did not intend to copy any particular picture of his, everyone in the theatre agreed that the part of nature that I chose to stage in the evening twilight should have his characteristic colouring. The fifth and final play to be staged in this series of Chekhov productions was Ivanov. And we can see here Simov's original set model and the design as it was finally realised on stage. Ivanov had originally been staged in 1887, but Chekhov considerably revised the play, and it was this revised version that was revived at the Moscow Art Theatre in 1904. This was the last Chekhov play that Simov designed. Writing almost 30 years later, he suggested that his approach would then be very different, emphasising the text above all. He wrote, the poetry of Chekhov's words will be felt more deeply, with nothing to distract the audience from their simplicity and profundity. The historical importance of these Chekhov productions is undeniable, and they are the productions for which Simov is most usually remembered. But I don't think that they really represent his most interesting work. For me, Simov's two most important designs the most impressive examples of his collaboration with Stanislavski and the work which really shows what he was capable of achieving in the theatre were for Gorky's play The Lower Depths, first staged in 1902, and for Ivanov's Armoured Train 1469 from 1927. These are two of the original design ideas for The Lower Depths and they immediately capture the atmosphere and the character of Gorky's play. Set in a homeless shelter, Gorky provocatively subtitled the play Scenes from Russian Life. Simov was determined to present an accurate picture of the lives of these characters, the squalor and hopelessness of their situation. This is a photograph of Simov's original set model and another of how it looked on stage. You can see Stanislavski sitting stage centre. The design was strikingly photographic in its accuracy and almost cinematic in its detail. And there were two very clear reasons for this. Gorky provided the company with a series of photographs of the poor and homeless taken in the city of Nizhny Novgorod. They were invaluable as character and costume research. To consolidate their understanding of what that life was really like, in Simov's words, at the bottom. It was arranged that the designer, along with a small group that consisted of the directors, their assistants and several of the actors, should visit the notorious slum district of Kitrovka in Moscow. The visit had a profound effect on Simov. He wrote, Groping my way along the long, dark passageways, I realised that the consequences of being here without support didn't bear thinking about. The unwary stranger would be lucky to escape with his life. At best, he would be knocked unconscious, robbed and stripped naked. And when he came to, would hardly recognise himself. The denizens of this place, ragged with fake identity cards, spin in a whirlpool of crime, grime, cunning and fetid corruption. The visit and the play itself had an equally profound effect on Stanislavski. Simov described him as burning with a sense of social injustice. There is no doubt that this production was a startlingly truthful and very early example of social realism in the Russian theatre. Not surprisingly, the censors took exception to several scenes, and according to Simov, more than a hundred lines of dialogue had to be cut from the play. He later remembered an instruction that Stanislavski gave him. Do not skimp on colour, he told me. I understood this advice in a figurative sense, 
because there actually were no colours at the very bottom of the social order. The sullen, dull, greyish murk of reality spoke volumes. This squalid, stinking, stagnant cesspit of underclass existence. Of all of the images of Simov's work that I have ever seen, these from the lower depths are the ones that I return to the most often. If Stanislavski was committed to stripping away artificiality and getting to the truth of the play, the scene, the character, Simov shared this commitment entirely. Perhaps nowhere is this more evident than in the production of Vsevolod Ivanov's play Armoured Train 1469, which had its first performance at the Moscow Art Theatre in November 1927. Staged to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the October Revolution, the play was seen as perhaps the first theatrical example of socialist realism, which became the standard for theatre in the Soviet Union. And it represented a major turning point for the Moscow Art Theatre. Simov had left the company in 1912, returning in 1926 to work on several productions for the opera studio. Stanislavski had originally contracted another designer to work on this new production. But it rapidly became obvious to the company that his ideas were totally impractical and could not be made to work on stage. So Simov was called upon to step in and save the day. He worked very quickly, redesigning the entire production, but also making use of some of the scenery that had already been constructed on the abandoned designs, adapting it for the new production. This was a complex five act play with a cast of over 50 actors. He wrote, it is now necessary to make hasty sketches, construct models, pick up the previous train of thought and fire up the engine again. The play itself was written in the most realistic manner with psychological richness and strong dramatic themes set against the background of everyday situations. Comparing the Leningrad designs with my own, I saw how the designer's vision, theoretically daring, was completely impractical in reality. Simov was unhappy with the final production. He realised how important the play was and he wanted to produce designs that reflected the feelings of the time. And it seems more than a little ironic now that this landmark production produced the following response from him in his memoirs. It bore all the traces of the old style conventional approach. It may have made a favourable impression from the point of view of its completeness and the careful use of lighting, but to my mind, it was overloaded with unnecessary detail. In 1907, it would have been acceptable, but not in 1927. It was completely out of keeping with the current constructivist style. As a result, the staging of the performance lacked cohesion. It was partly rooted in the past and partly in keeping with new trends. Well, curiously, I find that phrase, partly rooted in the past and partly in keeping with new trends, for me, sums up Simov himself. In some ways a traditionalist, but in other ways an innovator. In his original book, Yuri Nekoroshev provides us with a fascinating overview of Simov's life and career, placing him very effectively in the context of the early years of the Moscow Art Theatre. But it is the 50 or so pages included in the book, entitled Fragments from Memories, written by Simov himself, which are by far the most revealing. Now, I don't intend to try to convince the world that Viktor Simov was one of the founders of modern theatre design, although I do think that in some ways he was. I do want to re-establish him as a significant figure not only in the development of the role of the contemporary scenographer, but more importantly, as a major contributor to the early success of the Moscow Art Theatre, assisting through the visual power of his work to achieve that position of becoming perhaps the most influential theatre company in modern theatre history. Just like Stanislavski, Simov was a man of the theatre and Perhaps that's a phrase that we don't use so much today, but in his case, 
it was completely true. And I'd like to finish with this little description that he gives of his first visit to the theatre when he was a small child. My eyes were dazzled by the bright lights and the gilding. Sitting very high up, I was scared to look down, and the gaslight gave off an unfamiliar but pleasant odour. The glitter, the crowds, the overture, everything was entrancing. And there below me, for some reason, was a forest, an extraordinary moonlit forest. And someone was dancing. 